Hello and welcome back to Miss Anna Loves Grammar. In this video I'm concentrating on the visually and sensually stimulating poem by George Herbert entitled Easter Wings. Before I go any further on the meanings, messages or methods used by Herbert, I'd love for you to hit subscribe and join my tribe for all things English, literary and grammatical. So let's get into it. George Herbert spent the final three years of his life from 1630 to 1633 as a parson and clergyman in the countryside. What's crucial about this is that he has a deep rooted faith that he doubts around and finds challenging and at points makes him unhappy but is definitely at the heart of his thoughts and so this a sense in which this poem may be about his own journey of reflection around easter time and as a sense this is a dialogue with god we don't hear from god directly as readers but we do get to see this as a form of prayer this is about hope of resurrection in action and the freedom of Christ's victory for Herbert as a Christian. This poem is laid out in a way that looks like wings. If you can't see it right now because all you're seeing is a poem at 90 degrees, let me share with you what the original publication in 1633 looked like. Each stanza, as you can see, is mapped on a different page and therefore on both sides of this double page spread you can tangibly lift the wings in and out as you read, which definitely accentuates not only the, the graphology of this poem being a masterpiece, but also forces you to think about the transformative power of being able to fly. That whole extended metaphor that's at the heart of this poem is pushed ever more to your thought. So let's get into this analysis and now examine exactly what Herbert is offering us in terms of his incredibly progressive and incredibly insightful poem. It's very clear just from that colour coding, the juxtaposition at play between what's glorious and positive and what's devastating and negative that runs through this poem. And that's definitely equated to line length also. I want you to consider with me that the longest lines in lines 1, 10, 11 and 20 that run through this poem, they offer us the most hope and comfort, albeit through a Christian lens. And what's equally positive and acknowledging of the heart is the fact that each of these lines is written in an iambic pentameter, which echoes the heartbeat with its 10 beats per line. Yet the shortest lines, lines 5, 6, 15 and 16, they offer the most despair. They're short, they only have two syllables and they accentuate the blunt tool of honest, raw emotion. As I referenced earlier, this poem has been perceived as a prayer or a discussion with God and that's very clearly because the opening word is Lord. It's a direct address to God. And an analysis in this opening stanza of Adam and Eve's fall, most pertinently, Adam. The visual assonance across the opening line affects us. It balances the opening line, but it also challenges us. Store and Lord should rhyme, but they don't. Createdist and wealth should rhyme, but they don't. And so there's something about this uncomfortable reality that you created man in a place of plenty. And now we have to face the facts in line two, the adverb, foolishly he lost the shame. Adam paid a price for foolish actions. Line three takes us somewhere further. The repetition of more and more. It offers us the sense of destruction that comes from not following what God had wanted through free will, if you like. Decaying is so fascinating. When I think of decay, I think of rotten vegetables and fruit. But this is more than just material decay. This is about spiritual decay, too. And then we reach the climax, or if you like, the truest anticlimax in line five most poor. That seems ironic. That superlative most is so traditionally used alongside how much you have. But Adam is brought to being most poor, having nothing. 
it's fascinating when our poet enters. When he says, Oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day thy victories. That shift from past tense referring to Adam and directly to God makes this much more vulnerable in the first person, in the present tense, offering another acknowledgement this could be a prayer. But the most clear analogy that runs through this poem about birds, about wings, about hope, comes through the simile of the lark. Oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously. That simile in line eight works because of two very distinct reasons. Larks are associated with the dawn, a new day, a new hope. But that simile is also of the beautiful song they make harmoniously we're told. That adverb offers us to another image of worship linked to their beauty and to the way in which they sing with all their heart. And there's this sense of hope that our poetic voice longs to sing uh, this day thy victories. This day acknowledges it is about Easter day. And the principle behind it is that God died for sins and rose again. The speaker wants the same chance to live again. And that final line of than shall the fall further the flight in me, not only are we bombarded with alliterative sounds that fully flutter for us, but flight stresses the shift from tragedy to hopeful future and the opportunity to be new. Now, there's a definite re-emergence of what's tragic, as you can see in the second stanza. Tender, my tender age in sorrow did begin. We talk about a tender age as if um, that's when we're young and we're vulnerable. But sorrow, again, acknowledges that very vulnerably now, the poetic voice is sharing their own experience. And then we're struck with sibilance from line 11 all the way through, really, to line 13. It's constant, still, sickness, shame, sin. And all of these words talk of suffering and sin brought on by his own choices. And then it takes us to the pit of the poem in line 15 most thin. Again, another juxtaposed image. The loss of that close relationship with God in line 15 is now put as a metaphor of being physically wasted, broken and wrecked really by sin, completely ruined by it. To be most thin, to be wasting away, and especially as written from the poetic voice of a male, this is fascinating. We are taken to that pit of suffering to again be immersed into the transformative power that Jesus' death on the cross has for our poetic voice. Line 17. It's about victory. It's about let me combine. He moves from being a victim to the close friend of God. He's finding his strength. He's engaging with that. And then the penultimate line takes us somewhere totally different. For if I imp my wing on thine, I hear you. You might be thinking, I, I really don't know what this word imp means in this context. Well, an imp uh, is around the notion of a damaged wing of a bird. And you'd replace that damaged wing with a new feather. And so it's about mending what's already broken. Okay, for if I imp my wing on thine, if you fix my damaged wing, Lord, affliction shall advance the flight in me. Essentially, I am too weak without you, God. I need you to strengthen me. What makes this poem so pertinent over the centuries is that it quietly murmurs faith and passion. Now, whether you're religious or not, in the comments below, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this poem and what Herbert is driving at. Also, if you're watching this on Easter Day, happy Easter.